So when I think about things that had a significant impact on my food photography, tethering absolutely is one. Not only did it help improve the quality of my images, but also increase the efficiency of my photo shoots. I'm Joni Simon, food photographer and educator. Welcome to The Bite Shot, welcome to my studio. Today we're gonna to talk all about tethering and what you're gonna need just in terms of like the actual cables, different software options, as well as walk through some troubleshooting for you because inevitably, as you're getting all these different things set up working together, you may run into some trouble. So wanna help hedge those issues before you run into them. Also, a big thank you to Professional Photographers of America for sponsoring this video today. I'll share more about them and some of their awesome benefits later on in the video. But let's start out by talking about why tethering is so powerful and how it will practically impact your photo shoots if you have not shot tethered before. So first and foremost, for me, it's it's helpful to have immediate confirmation that my images are in focus and that the exposure levels are correct and that I can see that on a bigger screen. Because when I am shooting not tethered, I'm just looking on that little LCD screen and sometimes we miss really important details like focus and exposure and composition, details like that. So it really helps me to ensure that I got the shot when I'm looking on a bigger screen. So another thing about tethering that really helped to contribute to the efficiency of my photo shoots was in working tethered and having live view mode. So this is a component of some tethering softwares. We'll get into that in just a little bit, but the ability to see in real time what's happening in the scene and then also shooting on a tripod so that then I'm positioned at the computer and kind of looking at what's happening in the scene. And then if I wanna make one change or one adjustment, I just make that quickly as opposed to, you know, having to get back up and reorient the camera and do all those things that I'm like, I love this photo. I just want to slightly move this one little thing. I can do that much more quickly shooting tethered with live view mode. Tethering has also become a vital part of our workflow here in the studio when working with food stylists, prop stylists, assistants, our clients, that everybody can see in real time what's happening and make adjustments as needed. So it is much more helpful from the standpoint of a collaborative process. So if you are looking to expand your skills and looking to expand working with additional people, they will greatly appreciate if they can see as the images are coming in what is happening. And then the last thing that I'll say in terms of why tethering is so helpful and why it's so important in my process is in working with remote clients that a lot of the people who I shoot for do not physically live where I am and they don't come to the shoot physically, but they can participate remotely because I am shooting tethered. So for example, we just recently shot Home for the Holidays by Ashley Manella. This we did over kind of the holiday season actually this past year. It's coming out next year. You can pre-order your copy. Now we'll link it down below. But what was nice is Ashley's located in New York. We're here in Arizona, but we would give her the expectations of when to be online, when to check out the images. And so then as we shot each recipe for the cookbook, when we had our hero shot, I would text Ashley, say, hey, hop on Zoom with me real quick. She'd be able to jump into Zoom, see in real time what we were shooting. We could make small adjustments. She would approve the image and we'd be on to the next. This is so much much better than when I very first started out as a food photographer. I was not shooting tethered, but still working with remote clients. And I'd do a whole shoot and tear it down, send the images, and they'd be like, ah, oh, can we make this little change, this little tweak, which would require an entire other shoot. So obviously that's not a great solution for me and not a great solution for the clients. So by shooting tethered, we're able to collaborate in real time together and not waste each other's time and create the best product possible. So now let's get into kind of the technical parts of tethering. What do you actually need to make this happen? And so very first thing you wanna make sure to have a cable and the cable is going to connect your camera to your computer. And so that cable, there's not just one universal cable that works for everybody. That cable will be particular to the camera and to the computer and the ports on that computer that you're working with. For example, my Canon 5D Mark IV has a different port on the side of it in terms of that cable connection versus my Z7. So you're gonna wanna make sure to pay attention to which port is on that camera. One of the helpful things that I find to help solve this problem is if you head over to the Tether Tools website and they have a helpful kind of guide where you can select the specific camera that you have and they will tell you then which connection you're gonna need for that camera. Or 
if you're over on Amazon and you're looking at the different cables, they should list in the compatibility which cameras this is compatible with. Now, another thing you can do too, if you're not 100% sure and you're like, I wanna ask an actual human, <laughs> is this the right connection for my camera? Is if you go to B&H's website, I'll link it down below, and they have a live chat feature where you can ask questions of their customer service during business hours and get actual feedback as to, yes, that's the right cable. No, that's not the right one. Here's the one you want. And you're not obligated to buy there, but it is a really helpful service. And so then the other end of the cable, the part that goes into your computer, you want to make sure that that is compatible with your computer. And that's going to be a USB connection. But as maybe you're aware, the different computers out there, especially our friends in the Apple world, love to take away all of our standard USB ports and swap them out with USB-C. So just being mindful again, that depending on you've got the one end that goes into your computer and then the one end that goes into the camera, make sure that those ends agree with the gear that you have. Now, one of the things that is important to me when it comes to cables is I like a really long cable so that I don't feel restricted and that I can't move around adequately, that I've got a lot of leeway between the camera and the computer. But because I like a long cable, that means I wanna make sure that I'm going with a quality cable. So there are different cables out there. I have personally found the best success with Tether Tools and Area 51. I especially like the Area 51. They've got like their super long ones that are, I think there's 31 foot and then like a 62 foot, they're super long. So you really don't run into issues of being limited in terms of being able to move around. But sometimes with cheaper cables, not only are you gonna have connectivity issues, but if it's a super long cheap cable, you're gonna potentially have then a slowed connection that as you're taking photos, that they are not loading and getting into the computer quickly. But I have never had any speed issues with the Area 51 cables. Tether Tools has served me well over the years as well. So just be mindful that it is worth spending a little bit more money for a quality cable because if you get a crappy cable and it's not getting the pictures to the computer or it's not connecting, like you're just going to be frustrated and you're not going to move forward with tethering. Two of the good quality ones will last you a long time, so you shouldn't need to be replacing these frequently, if at all. Now maybe you're thinking, wait, Joni, what about wireless? Can't we just like wirelessly connect to our phone or an iPad? And absolutely, there are software out there that do that. But from a standpoint of shooting for clients and the reliability, there is something about a physical connection that really is helpful to me that I don't have to worry about interruptions in the Wi-Fi or issues like that, that I've got a good, solid, constant connection. Now, one other thing I'm going to highly recommend you purchase when you get your tethering cable is something to protect your ports, that the ports on your camera that you're inserting these cables into are apt to break if you kind of pull the cord, if it gets jerked in an awkward way or it, you know, kind of goes wonky, that that could damage the ports on the camera and those are expensive expensive, expensive to repair. So highly recommend getting a jerk stopper or a tether block. I personally use the jerk stopper that served me well, but it helps to ensure that if there is like a tug on the cable or something gets yanked, that it's not going to pull it out sideways out of that port. So it's gonna help to protect the ports on your camera. Now in terms of the physical setup of all of this, my setup has changed over the years as my spaces have changed and more importantly, as my computers have changed. Much of your decisions in terms of how to set this all up will be dependent on where you're shooting and the kind of equipment you have. So for example, when I very first started out, I was shooting in a small space and I was working with a laptop. And so I needed kind of somewhere to put the laptop that was still stable because I attended a conference once, a photography conference, and there was a demo going on on stage and they did not not have the laptop in like a nice stable place and inevitably somebody tripped over the cord the laptop went crashing to the ground and everybody like gasped in horror and so if you are shooting with a laptop, having some sort of tether specific table that helps to keep that in a secure position, that if there is a trip on the cord, I mean, ultimately too, whenever we have cords in the studio, very important to make sure that they are, you know, nailed down, maybe using some gaff tape to tape them down onto the floor in traffic areas. Also potentially not setting up your tethering area where people will be walking over the cable. Be mindful and thoughtful about just the physical setup of it in order to make 
make it easy for you to get around as well as potentially other people and to make sure everything is just nice and safe. I will say that is the benefit, of course, of the brightly colored cords you see out there. But I do have some different table options, laptop table options linked over in the blog post so you can go check that out. But now at this point in my studio, I'm shooting into a desktop PC. And so that's not moving around the studio with me. That's kind of in a fixed position at the desk. But what's nice is because I have that extra long cable, I can then run it from that computer into my scene and it's kind of all kind of physically close by. But again, that super long cable really helps give me the distance that I need because the computer's not moving in this case. Now I will say, if you get into tethering and you start to embrace it and you're like, oh my gosh, this has changed my life, kind of like happened to me, then it can help at a certain point then to get a second monitor because then you can have your kind of shooting and that main window all on a primary monitor, on a primary screen, and then you can have the live view in a second monitor. That can really be helpful to not have to toggle between the two, but that you just have both up at all times. But I would say again, that's not how I started. That is not required for effective tethering, but it's sort of like once you're ready to upgrade that 2.0 version, second monitor, third monitor, game changer. Although admittedly, I have three screens. And to be honest, the second screen is most often used for our playlist in Spotify. So whatever. So next order of business is selecting a software for your computer to shoot tethered. And there are a lot of different options out there. We have a blog post over at thebiteshot.com that shares a lot of the, I mean, all the ones that I know of, which there's a lot out there, but one of the critical features, one of the things that is a non-negotiable for me when it comes to a tethering software is that it has the ability for live view mode, which we mentioned earlier. The idea that as we are shooting into the computer, Computer, yes, we're seeing the images come through in kind of the main window, but then, then we can open up a second window where we get a live feed of what the camera is seeing in real time. So you can see how this becomes so much more powerful in composing our scene and those collaborative efforts and not all tethering softwares have that ability. For example, when I made the tethering video on this channel, the first one several years back, Lightroom did not have a live view feature for their tethering, but lo and behold, they have since released that ability and you can tether to Nikon and Canon. Sony, not, not totally sure. We'll leave a note on that one below. But for sure, Canon and Nikon have the ability to tether to Lightroom and have that live view functionality. Another option are the proprietary softwares from the manufacturers of the cameras having their own tethering software. So for example, Canon EOS, their EOS software is fantastic. It's one of my favorites. It's super simple, easy to navigate. If you wanna go deeper into that software, you can check out my previous video on that Canon EOS software. Software. But one of the drawbacks on a lot of those is that they are not also image processors such as Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop or Capture One. And so that is why several years ago I moved to and now exclusively use Capture One for my tethering and my image processing because it's an all-in-one solution. I don't have all these different softwares running around. It's all under the same roof. Now just to show you what I mean so that you can see this in practical terms, how this actually plays out and why it does save me time. So if I go ahead and take my tethering cable and plug it in to the computer here, and I've got this connected to a camera that's right behind me, right here, and it's looking at a bowl of cherries that I can see here, there's not much to look at, right? But what I did see is that when I plugged it in, all of a sudden it recognized the camera information as well as all the different camera settings. But if I hit the start live view button right here, all of a sudden we can see that bowl of cherries. But before I start digging into the settings, how I adjust that to get the appropriate exposure and to get those cherries in focus, I'm happy to share with you that today's video is sponsored by Professional Photographers of America. Join a community of over 33,000 photographers and find equipment insurance, education, and business tools made specifically for small business owners like you. Now, one of the benefits that you may not be aware of that comes with your membership is their indemnification trust. You're like, what is that? <laughs> Say that 10 times fast. This coverage is specifically intended to help you out in case cases of data loss recovery or an unhappy client. But when we think about data loss recovery, if you lose a bunch of images or you end up in some sort of legal issue with a client, it's great to know that PPA's got your back. All I have to do is call, file a claim, and boom, 
help is on the way. Now, assistance ranges from offering advice on how to handle matters, which is such great reassurance, knowing that you have somebody professional who's been there before, how to guide you through it. They also offer direct intervention when needed and even offsetting certain costs and losses. I mean, talk about peace of mind, knowing that one of the most experienced firms in helping professional photographers is right there, ready to help out PPA members. And so for a low monthly price, you get all of the benefits Benefits, including $15,000 of equipment insurance, the indemnification trust, education, customizable contracts and templates. And you can follow the link down in the description box below to get a special discount on your membership today. So whether you are just getting started or you have been a professional photographer for a long time, PPA can be a lifesaver with their indemnification trust. So thanks again to PPA. Now let's get back into Capture One. All right, so firing up our live view mode, we can see our bowl of cherries. We can see that we are connected to the Z7. We can see all of our camera settings here. We can see, for example, we're in manual mode. We can see that Joni's got a low battery at 40%. Come on, Simon, charge your batteries. And then we have our aperture, our ISO, our shutter speed, white balance, if we're shooting in RAW or JPEG. We can go into any of the given settings on our camera and do it here on the computer, which is really helpful, again, in situations when maybe your camera is like way high up above your scene and you can't reach it or you can't see behind it. Also helpful, if maybe, for example, you're working with a stylist and they're setting up the scene and you don't wanna get in their way, that you can control all the camera settings remotely from the computer. And so looking at this bowl of cherries, we've got a number of issues going on here. So let's go ahead and let's adjust the exposure as well as adjust the focus. This is something I get a lot of questions on. So be sure to pay attention here. So we are underexposed here. We are working just with the available light as an example here for this demonstration. So I always start with our aperture. I'm at f3.5 so I don't think I want to go too much more narrow in terms of the depth of field on this subject so we'll leave it there and then I'm shooting on a tripod so I can go with a slower shutter speed you can see I already have the ISO up a bit but let's maybe go ahead and, go ahead and throw it to 400 and then I'm going to slow down the shutter speed just a little bit more to again increase that exposure and that feels just about right we can go ahead and take a shot and we can even see once the image comes into our image preview over here, how our histogram's looking, and it's looking pretty darn good. So now at this point, let's go ahead and dive into another favorite feature that you will find in softwares that have the live view capability is the ability to get everything in perfect, sharp focus from the computer. Now, if the world of focus is a bit of a mystery to you and you're not sure fully how it functions, I have a video linked down below. I recommend you go check that out first so you just understand the way that focus works. And then that will make so much more sense when we get into working here in Tethered, why this works. So I have the camera set in auto focus mode because I'm going to be adjusting the focus here on the computer. So I have the camera in auto focus mode because we are going to be adjusting the focus here from the computer as opposed to manual focus and adjusting it with our hands on the lens, right? We're gonna have the computer do it instead. And you can see here in the live view window, we have this camera focus area. Now I could hit autofocus and it would, the camera would attempt to find where it's supposed to focus to, but that may or may not be where I want the focus to rest. We want the focus to go exactly where the eyes naturally rest in the scene. And so in order to do that, we want to use that function like in the focusing video where you have that little magnifying glass zoom in feature. So you can look at the exact spot where you want the focus to be and make sure that the camera captures it and keeps it right there. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So we go up here and make sure that we have the pan tool selected, got our little hand, and then I'm gonna go ahead and double click to the area where I want the focus to rest, where I want it to be the most sharp, the most clear, where that depth of field is resting, that's where I'm gonna zoom into. So right here in the cherry, and then I'm gonna hit autofocus. Aha! And look at that, the camera, super speedy. And people say that Nikon doesn't have fast autofocus. So we've got that perfect focus right on that cherry, right where we want the focus to rest. We can go ahead and hit the shutter button right now zoom out here and we come over and to see sure enough that cherry right there she is in tack sharp focus look at those details look at those details Whew. 
And again, because I'm shooting tethered and not relying on the little LCD screen on the back of my camera, I can zoom into this final picture and confirm, yes, that is in focus. And I can look at the histogram and know, yes, this is properly exposed. And I can even go in and start to make edits to this photos. I do have a separate video about editing over in Capture One, kind of a good get you started basics. So if you wanna watch that video, it's linked down below. Now, one of my other favorite features that we use often here in the studio is the ability to have an overlay over the image so that we can anticipate things like the crops that we need to make, or if there's a specific composition for artwork that is gonna be laid over top of the image, like for a magazine or for an ad campaign. So if we come in here back into the main area here of Capture One, and we come down into the shooting menu, down into overlay, we have the ability to upload. You can choose a file. A transparent PNG is gonna be the best for this. And then all you have to do is upload. You can see I've uploaded three different options here. So for example, the nine by 16, love that for the Instagram store right? And so you can see we can just toggle that off and on and you can see that overlaid on the image but it's also overlaid here inside of the live view as well. We can see here in live view mode exactly how that overlay is going to lay and again really helpful for the collaborative process and helps save us time to kind of shooting in the dark and hopefully this is going to be great for 9 by 16. Hopefully this will fit the square crop. Hopefully, right? The, no more hopefully. Like we know it's either fitting or it's not. And so for example if I picked here this magazine cover that then I can come into my live view and see here's this magazine cover artwork and we can adjust that down, adjust that bigger, kind of adjust our composition, adjust our scene that say, for example, I came in here. Let's go ahead and move our cherries. Ta-da, great taste. Again, they're talking about tomatoes and we've got cherries. Oh, well, <laughs> such is life, right? But we come in here and let me grab the pan tool one more time because now our cherries are out of focus. We moved them. So I'm just gonna come in right here, hit the auto focus. Very nice, go ahead and capture our image. And we come back over to the main window. We see the overlay doesn't quite line up here in the main window. So let's go ahead and take the scale down just a bit see how that works. Here's where we can move that overlay around to get the exact composition we're going for. You can see the same exact sort of idea in play when we were doing that kebab shoot a couple weeks ago. But now I just have to warn you that I have over the years, as I have been a big proponent of tethering, I hear back from folks who say, ah, oh, it's not working or they're running into issues. So I wanted to offer some different troubleshooting solutions for you in case you are trying to set these things up and it's not working. One common thing I see are folks who are shooting with older cameras that may not be compatible with more current softwares. So when you are looking at a particular software, it is worth taking the time especially before you purchase anything. Most of these all come with free trials, but before you purchase anything, double check through the compatibility. They should list which cameras they are compatible with, and they should also say, for example, here on the Capture One site, if it is not compatible, it will also say that as well. Now, if you've got a newer camera and that's not your issue, but you're still having problems, definitely check out your USB ports. Like make sure the actual ports on your computer and your camera are in good working order. I had an older MacBook Pro that I loved and was wonderful, but the USB port ended up crapping out on me at a certain point. And so I couldn't tether because it wasn't able to receive the signal from the USB cable. So make sure your ports like double check it with some other USB cables, some other USB devices, double check everything to make sure that it's not the actual ports themselves. Now, if it seems like the ports on everything is working, but the software is still not recognizing your camera, worth double checking then that the camera is being recognized by your USB port. You can go into, for Mac and for PC, there are instructions over on our blog post. You can go check that out to show you how to double check and make sure that your computer is actually recognizing the device via the USB. Now, from time to time, I have heard of people purchasing cables and receiving cables and the cables are not working for whatever reason, that there is some sort of like malfunction in that actual 
actual cable, in which case I would reach out to the retailer or to the manufacturer to get a replacement. This is definitely a reason why I think it is smart whenever you can. Again, I know not everybody can, but when you have the ability to purchase through a reputable retailer who has real actual support and customer service. I'm not saying Amazon doesn't have customer service, <laughs> but I'm just saying that if I buy from B&H or Adorama and something goes wrong, I know I can actually talk to a human at B&H or Adorama to help solve the problem and get me a replacement. And then one other place where I see folks run into trouble, especially when you're trying to figure out which software you wanna use, is not firing up multiple tethering softwares at once. For example, if you have the Canon EOS software open and you have the Capture One software open at the same time, neither of them will work because they're like kind of trying to fight for the connection and the communication with the camera and nobody wins, right? Like we're trying to get two people in a one person door at the same time, it ain't gonna work. So just make sure if you're testing out different softwares, only use one software at a time. But I'm gonna tell you, if you haven't tethered before, I am so excited for you because there's a whole new world when you start tethering. Granted, you have to figure out the software and the equipment and deal with potentially some technical frustrations. But if you persist through that, just like anything in the photography world, if you keep after it, if you keep pushing at it and go, now I'm gonna figure this thing out. Cause again, I promise I am not a rocket scientist. If I can do this, you can do it too. But I'm excited for you to start tethering. And again, thank you to PPA for sponsoring this video. Go check out that link down in the description box below for a special discount. And thank you to you for hanging out with me here today. It's always a treat, always a pleasure. I hope you stay out of trouble and I'll see you soon, all right? Bye.